I'm talking, I am talking mainly about this book here, which um, I published uh, in March with OUP. And I'm talking about the main ideas of that book. And uh, it's a book in ethics. It's a book in, uh, if you like, in ethical theory, in one sense of the phrase ethical theory, though it's also a book against ethical theory um, in a specific sense that I'll come to in a moment. And it's a book which is aiming to propose a different way of thinking about ethics um, and about moral theory. So in a sense, it's a book which is, I suppose, fairly revolutionary, fairly um, turning the tables upside down. Whether that um, is going to stick historically, whether people are going to agree with me that we need to make some revisions in the directions I suggest of, of what we do as philosophers who are interested in ethics, um, that of course remains to be seen. And pessimism is no doubt the correct default here. It's it's usual that people who are proposing revolutionary ways of doing subjects, um, it's usual that they don't succeed, but well, perhaps it isn't black or white between simply succeeding and simply failing. Perhaps one can influence, perhaps we can influence practice a bit um, without having a complete um, world domination enterprise succeeding. Because in a sense, what I'm proposing is um, against world domination enterprises. It's precisely an attack on what I see as a kind of imperialist ambition that some kind of uh, philosophers have to compel everyone to do philosophy their way. I'm very much against that. And actually, one of the things I'm proposing is um, more pluralism in philosophy. We'll come to that. I want to start by asking everyone here to think about wow moments and to ask you, when was the last time you had a wow moment? When did you last see something that made you gasp um, in a good way? Uh, we can talk about things that make you gasp in a bad way too, and they are interesting for the student of epiphanies. But I want to start with those little moments in life where um, you see something that um, that really gives you, we might say, a transformative kind of pleasure or happiness. The little moments that make you step back from routine, take you out of your side, uh, out of yourself, outside of yourself in maybe just a small way, which make you see the world in a fresh way. When was the last time you had a wow, a wow moment of that sort? And uh, for me, right here, right now, well, yesterday evening, I was I went outside to the front porch just to look at the garden for a moment. And um, I think, yes, I was checking to see whether a shopping delivery had come, actually. So it was quite a banal reason why I was out there. And there was um, a hummingbird hawk moth in the purple weeds at the side of the path in our front garden. And I don't know if you've seen one of these creatures, but they are quite astonishing. They are moths that look like hummingbirds. And they're very big for moths, very small for birds. Their wings flap with enormous speed um, and they have this long curly proboscis that they unfurl as a hummingbird does its tongue to stick it into the nectar in the flowers that they're interested in and, and to drink the nectar. So I, I walk out of the front door and there's this astonishing science fiction like creature with its nose in one of the plants in my garden. And that was a wow moment. And so I'm, I'm asking you to begin with to think about um, what wow moments you've had in your experience recently um, and what those moments were like, uh, what it said to you to have such experiences, um, what it made you think that such things happened. And I asked this question um, on Facebook a while back and uh, doing Facebook is not always time wasting. Sometimes it's a form of research and that was a form of research because I asked my friends on Facebook what are the great small pleasures of your life? What are the great small pleasures of your life? And people came back with things like the taste of a fresh ripe strawberry, uh, looking into the garden and seeing a flower that has come into bloom that wasn't there the night before, uh, the smell of gorse in the sunshine after rain, um, 
getting a letter from a friend um, unexpectedly, these kind of things, the great small pleasures of our lives. That was something that people proved very ready to talk about. I think I got something like 249 responses to that thread on Facebook. And a lot of my friends had something to say about that. And that's um, helpful and encouraging to me and my project, because, of course, the word epiphanies is a rather daunting one. Um, and people either don't know what the word means or they associate it with um, the Christian festival of Epiphany, January the 6th, which is supposedly the date when Jesus in the manger was visited by the, uh, the three kings. Um, why he was still in the manger when you know his parents had 12 days to sort out better accommodation for him, um, why he was still in Bethlehem at all when they didn't live in Bethlehem but in Nazareth, I'm not quite sure. But anyway, um, that's the story, and a charming story it is, of the three kings, or however many magi there were, coming across something that was to them a revelation, an extraordinary vision which changed the way they saw everything else. The other association that people may have with the word epiphanies, um, which may or may not be a helpful association, is an association with James Joyce's use of the word. One of the things I want to suggest in this brief presentation is that our culture, whether we trace it back to its Greco-Roman roots or back to its Christian roots, our culture in the West um, has always had the concept of an epiphany. Um, that's there in, in the Jewish Bible, that's there in the Christian Bible, and that's there today, this notion of an epiphany. It's not a word that we've had until fairly recently. And as I say in the book at some detail, if you if you if you want to buy my book and delve into this, then I talk about the roots of the word epiphany in modern discourse. And it comes from James Joyce um, and his book, Stephen Hero, which was only published in 1940. And epiphany has become a term of art, a stock term in uh, English literature particular in particular, sorry, in literature departments in particular, it's been less used by philosophers. It's attained common, common currency um, via the use of the word epiphany in Calvin and Hobbes and other places. It's a term that we're reasonably familiar with. But my, my point is um, whether or not we have helpful associations with the word epiphany via its use in religious contexts and academic contexts, or whether we have unhelpful connotations coming to us through those sources. We know what we're talking about when we talk about epiphanies. We're talking about wow moments. We're talking about aha moments. And um, these have become of great interest to me as a philosopher for a number of reasons, which I'll now try and say something about. So one of the reasons why I got interested in epiphanies was because of um, my increasing aversion about 10 years ago now, about 15 to 10 to 15 years ago now, my increasing aversion to the way that moral philosophy, the subject which is my main concern as an academic, was being done around me. My increasing aversion too to the way I was doing moral philosophy myself. And a lot of the time we seem to have a sort of cage fight set up in normative ethics between different theories. And when you're writing an ethics course, it can be difficult to know how to do it, how to structure it, except via this contest of the theories. So you have the consequentialist approach. All that matters whenever you act is the consequences of whatever you do. It's all about the future and nothing else every time you act. And you have the Kantian approach. So whatever you do, it has to be a fair action in a very specific sense of fair meaning that it has to be something that anyone else in your position could do um, just as well as you can in your situation. They would have just the same reasons as you have to act here in this situation. Um, their action would be just as justified and it would be justified as your action. Um, or there's the contractarian approach. Uh, what human beings do, either explicitly or implicitly, what human beings do is they get together and they make a, a contract, an agreement about how they're going to treat each other. And that implicit or explicit virtual or actual agreement is the foundation of morality. 
Um, it's all about what, in, in Scanlonian phrasing, it's all about what actions we can reasonably accept from others um, and what actions, what actions are permitted, uh, which actions are permitted depends on what others can reasonably accept from us and on, on what we could reasonably accept from them if the tables were turned. So you get philosophers saying um, of each of these approaches, my way or the highway, this is the correct way to do ethics. There's no alternative to it. Um, you must be a Kantian or you must be a utilitarian or you must be a contractarian or you must be a virtue ethicist. The only thing that matters, some philosophers have said, is um, adherence to the virtues, living out the virtues. Um, and any other way is just mistaken. And so people get into careers where they think that their whole energy should be diverted to this task of disproving what everyone else says about normative theory and showing that they and they alone are correct. Now, I had a bit of a midlife crisis in 2008, um, which was occasioned, and I, I don't very much like thinking about the implications of saying that I had a new midlife crisis 15 years ago, but there we are, we'll pass over that. I, I had a bit of a midlife crisis because what happened was I had a mountaineering accident uh, which put me in hospital for 20 days. When I was three quarters of the way through writing a book on ethics, which was structured in precisely this way, um, here's a theory, um, here's an ethical theory, you know, sort of whack-a-mole approach. Here's an ethical theory, whack, that's why it's wrong. Here's another one, whack, down it goes. Here's a third theory, whack, down it goes. So I had a succession of chapters in this introduction to ethics, which I wrote in that way. Consequentialism, here's the position, here's what's wrong with it. Um, virtue ethics, here's the position, here's what's wrong with it. And I was supposed in the last chapter to be pulling out like a rabbit from a hat, my own theory, um, which was going to emerge triumphant from the contest of the theories as the only truth about ethics and all the other theories are wrong. That was the idea. And I was lying there in hospital after this accident thinking, is this really the way I want to go? Is this really all there is to be said about ethics? Is this really how, the, how I want to spend the rest of my career, the rest of my life, thinking about the one true theory and how everything else is, is wrong and all the other alternatives to it have to be bulldozed out of the way? Um, what's true in them is just a corollary of things which are right about my theory. What's wrong in them is all their own. And here are the faults of them. And I will hear I will brook no argument on the faults of these alternatives to my view. I just thought, is this really what I want to do the rest of my life? And of course, when you've just had an any fatal accident, you're in quite a good position to have that question brought forcibly to your attention. Uh, that question about what you're going to do with the rest of your life now that you have a rest of your life and aren't um, in a body bag. Um, what are you going to do with it? And it came to seem to me that there must be some better ways to think about ethics and the contest of the theories. And one of my main guides in this thinking was um, Bernard Williams, for whom this question, um, if not moral theory, then what, which is the heading of one of the sections in, in my book, if not moral theory, then what, is a question that people often put to Williams um, in his career, because he was often seen, as perhaps I am, I'm not sure, as a very destructive philosopher, as Richard Hare once said to Bernard Williams, you knock everything down, but what do you propose to put in its place? That was a question which many people thought was a serious one for Williams. And I just want to read a passage from Williams, which I take it uh, gives Williams answer to this question. And this is from his 1985 book, Ethics and the Limits of Philosophy. Um, and it's uh, on page 93 of that book in most editions. There could be a way of doing moral philosophy, William says, that started from the ways in which we experience our ethical life. Such a philosophy would reflect on what we believe, feel, take for granted, the ways in which we confront obligations and recognise responsibility, the sentiments of guilt and shame. It would involve a phenomenology to the ethical life. This could be a good philosophy, but it would be unlikely to yield an ethical theory. Ethical theories seem to start from just one aspect of ethical experience, namely beliefs. The natural understanding of an ethical theory takes it as a structure of propositions, which, like a scientific theory, 
in part provides a framework for our beliefs, in part criticizes them or revises them. So three vital features that Williams draws out there of typical systematic moral theories, as I tend to call them. They're quasi-scientific. They're all about propositions and structures of propositions. They're all about our beliefs. And I wanted to find, and I think Williams wanted to find, a way of doing ethics which was none of those things, which wasn't quasi-scientific, which didn't have the ambition that scientific theories typically have to be, for some domain, the explanation of everything in that domain. Contrast um, with that scientific ambition to be the one true explanation of some domain, uh, the notion of interpretation that you get in the humanities. Um, if I offer an interesting, plausible, creative, rich, imaginatively engaged interpretation of King Lear or Romeo and Juliet or the birth of Venus or whatever it is, if I offer, offer a rich interpretation of it, that doesn't have to be the one true correct understanding of that work of art. In fact, it had better not be. The humanities don't just stop when we get a rich interpretation of some work of art. The humanities go on because what you have to say about a work of art, at least if it's any good, is never the final word on it. And so I wanted to be non-scientific about ethics in specifically that way. I wanted to propose an interpretation of our understanding, which was not meant to be the interpretation. And alongside that, more polemically and more aggressively, I want to suggest too that it's actually a mistaken approach to seek that kind of finality and definitiveness that typical moral theories often do. And then on the propositionality of moral systematic moral theory and on the belief basedness of systematic moral theory, well, I wanted to jump aboard some bandwagons that were already rolling in ethics and in philosophy more widely. One is the thought which is central to virtue ethics, that a lot of what's most important about our ethical lives is not pitched at the level of conscious beliefs. It's about dispositions, it's about um, habits, and after all, virtues are, are precisely good dispositions. They're good dispositions to act and to feel, um, according to Aristotle. And that doesn't necessarily come out either in belief or in anything propositional at all. It's the way we are. It's something like a motor skill rather than being a belief. Um, so I thought that that was a rich and interesting way to think about ethics and one which gets us away from uh, what I think I tend to view as the rather regrettable focus on beliefs and propositions, on, on beliefs, sorry, that um, ethicists tend to have because they are influenced by the scientific model. Connectedly with that, there's a thought about experience where a lot of what we experience is not readily articulable in propositions, not at least in the neutral quasi-scientific way that propositions are often are articulated. Experience looks much richer than propositions that describe experience. And I wanted to try and get more into the matter of experience. So going on from that passage in Ethics and Limits of Philosophy that Williams wrote in 1985, while I was still a mere undergraduate, and which I was unaware of um, until I read Ethics and Limits of Philosophy in about 1991, I wanted to try and do something more like, as the subtitle of, Eth of Epiphanies has it, an ethics of experience, meaning something that wasn't necessarily tied to beliefs and propositions in the way that moral theories typically are, and something that goes deeper into the nature of our experience than that. And I wanted a kind of approach to ethics which looked beyond um, the contest of the theories, looked beyond trying to find a single explanation of everything, and instead provided not the single explanation of everything, but a rich and fruitful account of, well, maybe not everything, but as many things as possible. And that meant, coming back to moral theory, that I had a place in my, my new way of thinking, this new outlook which was developing between 2009 and about uh, 2019, over that decade, 
I had a place in my view for the kind of approach that the various moral theories, utilitarianism, um, deontology, contractarianism, virtue ethics, whatever else, I had a place in my approach for what those theories had to say. It was just the exclusiveness of what they had to say that I wanted to deny and want to deny. This is still my view. So um, I, you come across in normative ethics, in, in moral theory, you come across all these schemas which say things like um, the reason why X is the right act in circumstances C is because dot, dot, dot. And then some theory based explanation fills in the dots. And I wanted to wage a little war against the definite article, and I still am waging this war. I wanted to say when we ask questions like what is the reason why murder is wrong? What is the reason why human life is valuable? What is the reason why it's good to have friends? This word the is playing tricks on us. And sometimes I call this the curse of the definite article. The word is playing tricks on us because it's encouraging us before we've had a chance to see the crucial move in the trick, to allude to a famous line of Wittgenstein's, before we've noticed the, the crucial move in the trick, the conjuring trick, the trick's already been played on us. When we try to answer the question, what is the reason why murder is wrong? We're already implicitly assuming that there's just one reason why murder is wrong and that we have to find that out. And once we've found that out, we have um, something, we have a proposition, we have a theoretical view, which we ought to be defending from all comers and beating down all opposition to, and we're straight back into the contest of the theories. And I wanted to say, and I want to say, that different moral theories can give us quite a lot um, of useful material in particular areas, but what we don't need from them and what we should resist is the exclusivity claim, the unique correctness claim. So, for example, there's a nice passage in David Wiggins, which I, I quote in a recent paper called Inwardness in Ethics, where Wiggins says there are situations where what you need to do to decide what your actions should be in this situation is to multiply the utility of the action times its probability. There certainly are situations which are just like that. For example, when you're playing billiards, um, that's exactly what you should do. In order to maximise the number of points that you score in the billiards game, you should work out uh, which shot you should go for on the basis precisely of comparing how likely it is that you'll get this shot and how much you achieve by getting it. And that's a multiplication sum. That's a standard piece of decision the theoretic um, arithmetic. So there are contexts where that approach works and there are contexts where thinking in the terms of the other uh, systematic moral theories is going to work too. Um, what isn't right is to think that what you can say about each of those contexts is what you must say about every context. So that's the negative case in the remaining eight minutes. I'll talk a bit about the positive case. That's what I'm against. What am I in favour of? Let me say a bit more about that. Well, I thought perhaps what we need in place of this world domination enterprise, this vision of ethical theory as a kind of cage fight where you build up one systematic structure that covers everything and you eliminate all the other alternatives. Perhaps what we need instead of that single grand récit, that single big story, is lots and lots of smaller stories about interesting, diverse parts of the ethical landscape. And Williams, again, is my guide in thinking about this. Um, such a philosophy, he says in the piece I read before, would reflect on what we believe, feel, take for granted, the ways in which we confront obligations and recognise responsibility, the sentiments of guilt and shame. It would involve a phenomenology to the ethical life. In those words, um, Williams is suggesting a whole variety of possible research projects for ethicists, none of which is in this way a single um, world domination enterprise, a single attempt to control everything with one theory. Think about what we believe and feel and take for granted. Um, I've said in things I've published that the sound of a successful pre prejudice is silence. And I think that that's an important line, given how talkative and how wordy moral philosophy typically is. We always have to look at the, the, the margins and the boundaries. What is moral philosophy not saying? 
And what is moral philosophy making impossible to say? What we take for granted is really important. The ways in which we confront obligations and recognise responsibility. What is it like to feel yourself under an obligation? Is there a specific experience that it's like? And if so, what is that experience? Connectedly, what are the experiences of guilt and shame? What are they like? And then last of all, this question um, of a phenomenology of the ethical life. What is it like to be an ethical agent? Well, in chapter four of my book, I broadened that question out. What is it like to be an ethical agent? Into the much wider question, what is it like to be a human being? Because I think there's a simple question there, a very basic question that philosophers have not always had their eye on as clearly and, ex and explicitly as they might have had. And I think in talking about our phenomenology, we're talking about a very wide uh, range of kinds of experience that have sometimes been invisible to philosophers precisely because of our cognitive and our propositional focus. And one of these things um, in this plethora of possible smaller scale projects, I got thinking about the phenomenon of glory. So what's going on? It's clearly something that's hugely important to human beings. Um, what's going on, philosophically speaking, when human beings are in a sports stadium and they see some wonderful achievement performed in that sports stadium? So someone hits a century off 48 balls or someone does an miraculous um, save of a, a ball that seems destined to go in the net or someone uh, wins uh, a tennis match in with extraordinary elan and the crowd go wild about this performance. This is the phenomenon of glory. And I wanted to say about that in an essay I wrote on this, which is kind of a warm up for epiphanies. I wanted to say about that. What is this phenomenon of glory and how is it that moral philosophers have so little to say about it? Because of the items that are on William's list that I just read out, we might be we might as philosophers be particularly interested in obligation, responsibility and guilt. We're good at talking about those, perhaps, within limits. We're not very good at talking about glory, yet glory is something manifestly important in ordinary people's human lives, whether they go to Glastonbury or to um, Headingley or to um, some football stadium. I was going to say the field of dreams, but maybe not anymore. Not the way man you are playing at the moment. Um, People find something enormously important in experiencing glory together. What is that? What can we say about it? Can we say anything about it in its own right? Or are we going to be forced to reduce it to categories we already have, like the category of advantage and pleasure and uh, all these categories which edges back towards a familiar moral systematic way of thinking in which what counts is only either prudential benefit egotistical benefit, benefit for me, or moral benefit, um, a raise in the level of utility in the world or something like that, a raise, a rise in our standing as moral agents. What can we say about things like glory that get us outside those rather constricting frameworks and into new ways of thinking? That was my question. And um, it took me eventually towards talking about epiphanies and about um, what epiphanies might be and what we might say about them philosoph philosophically. And I've been pursuing this project now for something like uh, eight years. Um, two books have come out of it and a definition of epiphany has come out of it. And Socrates used to say that before we do any other philosophy, we should start by defining our terms. Um, it's actually rather studied that I didn't start by defining my terms. I started by giving you examples because one thing I think about epiphanies is that there isn't an if and only if definition. There isn't a hard edged necessary and sufficient conditions definition of what epiphanies are. Like most things that actually matter in real life, um, as opposed to formal logic and mathematics, this is a phenomenon with blurry edges. So I'm going to finish this talk um, standing Socrates advice on its head. I'm going to finish this talk by defining epiphany. Um, but before I do that, I'm actually going to indulge myself by giving you another example of an epiphany. And you can then ask yourselves how well my definition and my example fit together. So here's an example from W.H. Auden, um, which is quoted in Humphrey Carpenter's 1981 um, 
biography of Auden, if you want the publication details, this is page 19 of my book. One fine summer night in ni June 1933, Auden says, I was sitting on the lawn after dinner with three colleagues at a school. He was teaching at a school at the time. When quite suddenly and unexpectedly, I felt myself invaded by a power which, though I consented to it, was irresistible and certainly not mine. For the first time in my life, I knew exactly, because thanks to the power I was doing it, what it is to love one's neighbour as oneself. I was also certain, though the conversation continued to be perfectly ordinary, that my three colleagues were having the same experience. In the late case of one of them, I was later able to confirm this. My personal feelings towards them were unchanged. They were still colleagues, not intimate friends. But I felt their existence as themselves to be of infinite value, and I rejoiced in it. I recalled with shame the many occasions on which I'd been spiteful, snobbish, selfish, but the immediate joy was greater than the shame. I also knew that the power would, of course, be withdrawn sooner or later, and that when it was, my greeds and self-regard would return. The memory of the experience has not prevented me from making use of others, grossly and often, but it has made it much more difficult for me to deceive myself about what I am up to when I do. So that's the Auden quotation, and that, I take it, is an experience, a particular uh, recording of an experience which I think deserves to be called an epiphany. Now, last of all, in this talk, see how well that example of an epiphany from Auden fits with how I want to define an epiphany. This is pages eight to nine in my book. An epiphany is an overwhelming, existentially significant manifestation of value in experience, often sudden and surprising, which feeds the psyche, which feels like it comes from outside. It's something given relative to which I'm a passive perceiver, which teaches us something new, which takes us out of ourselves, and to which there is a natural and correct response, at least one, possibly more. I'm not saying that there's a uniquely correct response necessarily. Once again, I'm avoiding the definite article there. Often the correct response is love, often it's pity, or again, creativity. It might also be anger or reverence or awe, or a hunger to put things right, a hunger for justice, or many other things. It may be something that leads directly to action or new knowledge. It may also be something that prompts further contemplation or reflection, or other responses again. So that's how I define epiphany. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm taking as central to my research project um, in the work I'm doing at the moment, and in the work I expect to do in the near future. What I'm not saying, um, I'll close by emphasizing this again, what I'm not saying is, hey, everybody, all moral philosophy from now on has to be about epiphanies all the time, and it's not allowed to be anything else. I'm absolutely not saying that, first of all, because um, it would once again be extremely boring um, to make moral philosophy about nothing else. And secondly, because the whole point of going after epiphanies was to go in detail after one specific phenomenon without making any claim of the kind that systematic theories so predictably um, paint themselves into a corner by insisting on. I'm not making any claim that there's just one game which is the only game in town. On the contrary, I'm saying there are lots of games in town um, and this is one that we might well attend to. This is one that it would be useful to attend closely to. Um, the game of epiphanies, the game of thinking about this aspect of our experience of what it's like to be human beings. OK, I'll finish there. Thank you very much, Sophie Grace, for sharing, you know, sharing your thoughts and inspiring us to more epiphanies. That's been really great and obviously for wonderful timekeeping. So let me just pass directly to Alex. I'll start with an anecdote. Um, in around uh, 2008, I attended a conference on the philosophy of wine. And halfway through it, the conference organizer uh, only only half jokingly banned the word epiphany because it seemed to be cropping up in every talk. Speaker after speaker told of their ooh la la moment when they first encountered what drinking wine could truly be. And the ban uh, didn't have its intended effect. Uh, it simply prompted everyone to start thinking of their own first wine epiphany, or in my case, worrying that they were defective because they'd never had one, just tasted nice. Um, one of the 
great joys of reading Sophie Grace's book is that it prompts you uh, to scour your life for epiphanies and indeed uh, the talk we've just heard, if only to see how well they map onto what she has to say about them. Other books, lesser books, would see this as anecdotalizing indulgence, whereas Sophie Grace's book almost commands you to give attention to key moments in your life. It helps you to eat those moments out so you're not left as I was uh, at the wine conference, the philosophy of wine conference, feeling bereft because you don't sit anywhere on the epiphany spectrum. We all, uh, as she makes clear, have peaks and troughs in our ethical experience, our experience of value, and the peaks needn't be snow covered and circled by eagles to count as epiphanic, if that's the right uh, adjective. I'm not going to regale you with my own epiphanies, though, my hillocks, as it may be. Uh, instead, the fascinating though they are to me. Instead, I want to um, press Sophie Grace a little about some of the philosophical binaries in her work. Um, and I put this is where I have to bring the slide up. Uh, try to. Go. Um, so, of course, it's not showing. Um, is that visible? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Thanks. OK, and now. Right. Um, so I put five examples of the binaries I have in mind. Um, there are others. Uh, I don't think what I have to say applies to them all, but Let's see. Um, they're interestingly different from one, one another and yet overlapping and related in their significance. And in each case, Sophie Grace, Grace notes that philosophers have often devalued the second of the pair, the second element relative to the first and argues persuasively, uh, I thought, uh, that this is a mistake. And obviously a mistake as soon as you start thinking about epiphanies and taking them seriously. So to illustrate with this first pair, uh, Sophie Grace asks us to reevaluate the contrast between a detached and an engaged attitude to the world we inhabit. The detached or impersonal viewpoint is privileged, it's celebrated, it's superiority taken as given in philosophy and beyond, I'm sure. But we always, by always insisting on a detached, pers pers blah, by always insisting on a detached perspective neutral attitude to the world. We miss, Sophie Grace, Sophie Grace uh, argues, we miss what we see if we acknowledge the experiences we have of the world as engaged embodied inhabitants of it. The second contrast is between perception as value free, a means of disenchanting or taking the magic out of and so truly understanding the world and value laden perception that sees value in the world. Uh, this is a, a, a strong theme uh, in this and in her previous book, and it happens uh, with epiphanies. We perceive value. The third contrast, I'll run through these a little more quickly, is between an epistemology that champions the objectively testable over the subjectively certain and questions the latter. And that contrast carries over into a Fourth contrast in philosophical writing styles this time between the impersonal and the personal style. And fifth, uh, relatedly, between contrasting styles of philosopher, the painstaking logic chopper, if you like. That's actually my phrase, not Sophie Grace's, and the visionary in its edged sense. So I call these binaries not because I'm setting them up to break them down. I think the contrasts are perfectly well drawn and real, even though they're also, as Sophie Grace would agree, continua rather than black and white divisions. Um, where I part company, uh, I think, from Sophie Grace is in thinking that we often benefit from the existence of both elements of these binaries. They can coexist and enhance one another, whereas I think, uh, in spite of uh, what she sometimes says, I think Sophie Grace leans towards junking the first element. Uh, we'll see. Uh, 
you can clarify uh, Sophie Grace uh, if there's time in the Q&A. Well, so for example, she's painfully funny, uh, especially if you know that she's the executive editor of one of the foremost uh, philosophy journals uh, in analytic philosophy. She's painfully funny in her caricature of the ambitions of a typical journal article in analytic philosophy. But I think standard issue analytic philosophy journal articles, even of the uh, order that uh, she caricatures, have their place, so long as they're not seen as the only way of doing philosophy. They're made better, though, and this I agree with, by their authors being acquainted with philosophy written in a more visionary style. And I think the converse is also true. We need a philosophical ecosystem that can be inhabited by both approaches. Or, and I'll I'll just talk about the second, I won't talk about all five of the uh, binaries in this list. I'll take the second pair. Um, if I understand her correctly, Sophie Grace thinks we should, indeed that we cannot help, but look on the world as replete with value, as value laden. Above all, obviously, in the moment of an epiphany, to see the world as disenchanted is to miss something. Against this, I suggest we can and should champion both ways of looking at the world. Each way of looking benefits from the existence of the other, but they can coexist. And uh, I think Sophie Grace could avail, of, avail herself of this more tolerant position, because as she says, she's not anti-science, as she says in her book, um, she's not anti-science, she's anti-scientism. Scientism is the attempt to foist scientific methods uh, in, uh, onto everything to the exclusion of all else. But science in its proper domain, if you like, does, I suggest, require value neutral perception and value neutral hypotheses. This is where I think we part company. Sometimes you just need to look at what a meter is saying and count instances prior to doing statistical analysis. Um, and I'd be interested to hear what uh, the non philosophers present, uh, or not the non, the people outside the philosophy department uh, have to say about this, uh, social scientists. Scientists uh, can sometimes help us know whether to trust an epiphany, for example, or which of two epiphanies to trust as and when they point in different directions, as with the recognition of suffering in non human animals through an epiphany, or the recognition, if it were to be uh, epiph epiphanic, of whatever it is that hunters see in hunting. Um, I think Sophie Grace goes for the strategy of saying that's not a real epiphany, which uh, I find a little bit suspect, but I think science can help us and it has to be value neutral is my suggestion. So that's the question I'll end on uh, for discussion or for Sophie Grace to answer as it may be. Doesn't scientists sometimes have a useful role to play in ethical decision making? And shouldn't it, in playing that role, be in some sense value neutral in its evidence base and in the formulation of its hypotheses? More generally, don't both pairs in her binaries, or at least uh, these ones, thrive off each other rather more than she allows? OK, I'm done there. Thanks. Thank you very much, Alex, for sharing your really, really interesting um, thoughts and response. Let me invite um, Sean, Sean Cordea, please, for the second response. Um, thanks, Irma. Uh, thanks, Sophie Grace, and thanks, Alex. Extremely interesting. Um, I wanted to be a bit more specific than perhaps Alex was. Um, maybe even less interesting, certainly not epiphanic, but anyway, here it goes. Um, I'm hoping that one particular part of your book, if I talk about that, might um, open things up a bit. So you talked about the question of if not moral theory, then what um, in relation to Bernard Williams, in relation to which you challenge a thesis of his, um, the internal reasons thesis. OK, which and, and I'll try and say what that is as clearly as possible and then why it matters and then say something about what you've said about it. Um, I mean, it was all good because it meant I could go back to Mike Williams and look at what he says about this. Uh, so we take a statement or William says we take a statement like A has a reason to fire where phi is some action or there is a reason for A to fire. So a is an agent and phi is an action. So Sean has a reason to attend the seminar. 
or there is a reason for Sean to attend the seminar today. OK, uh, and he gives this an internal and external re reading and the internal reading is that statements like Sean has a reason to go to the seminar means that that's that there is something in my what he calls sub subjective motivational set somewhere in me, somewhere inside me, there is a motivation that is connected in the right way to this reason. So the statement that I have a reason to do this um, is uh, the reason is connected to something in my motivational set, something quite, you know, could be quite attenuated, but it's there, right? Uh, same with there is a reason for Sean to attend the seminar. There must be something in me to for me to est establish that reason, OK? Now, uh, the other kind of statement would be external. There's a reason for me to attend the seminar, but actually there's nothing inside me that's got any interest in, in doing that or whatever. <laughs> I've got I've actually no, no, no motivations in me are connected to that reason. It's external, it's outside. Now, William comes to the conclusion that they're, they're just probably, you can't see how there are any external reasons. When you make a statement that there's a reason for someone, somehow it has to be connected with their motivation, right? So why does this matter? Well, the, the reason it really matters or the main reason, I think, rather than just kind of uh, for its own sake and talking about what reasons are and all the rest of it, which might be interesting. But the real the real issue here, as you, Sophie Grace, say yourself on page 109, if anything seems intuitively certain in ethics, it is that we all have indefinitely many clear and obvious reasons of obligation, which are in no way dependent on the particularities of our psychologies. Could you give examples? We, you know, the, we, it, you know, there is a reason for you um, not to vote for the Nazi party and so on. Just just obvious heinous crimes. There's good reasons not to do. And these don't depend on anything in inside me about what my, you know, what, what my um, desires or motivations might be. So. And you give the interesting case of occupying a role. You've got a role case, so you're in a role. And in fact, as you say, Bernard Williams has this example himself. So he takes the example of Owen Wingrave um, from Henry James's story and Britain's opera. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> and Owen Wingrave's parents are um, intent on him joining the army and say that he should join the army and because they're a family with military tradition and there are all these reasons for him to join the army and nothing you know in Wingrave has got any motivation to join the army himself. OK, and the example is supposed to show, but look, there may be there may be things to be said in favour of joining the army and he may be browbeaten into joining the army or we can say you know, all this stuff. But if, if there's nothing inside him to which to which to connect that reason, to get that reason going, then he doesn't have a reason to join the army. And this, that, that's perhaps you know, that to, so. William says that there are really no external reasons. It just doesn't. It's going to connect with something, right? OK, so and you yourself develop this kind of story about roles. So someone in a role and you say um, you could be in a role and absolutely hate it and have, and have no motivation whatsoever. You just you, 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 just, you don't identify it with in any, in any sense. You just uh, a drudge, a drudge job or whatever. On the other hand, you could strongly identify with the role um, and all the reasons that the role gives you would be internal. They're really connected to you. That's what you want to do. So there's there's your two extremes, and you and you rightly say that it doesn't. That those aren't the only options. And in in a role, someone can can come to uh, identify with it, see the reasons, act on those reasons, and therefore you say that you know there. I think you say <laughs> there is a sense in which there are some external reasons, and this is one way in which we can sort of come to. Uh, they, they, they reveal themselves, if you like. OK, um, so therefore what you do, you, you reject Williams' thesis, and this is really interesting because what, like like you, as you said, Williams was, was is identified as the kind of um, almost like the ethical theory curmudgeon. He's kind of like, you know, as it um, was it hair you mentioned hair. He said, well, you knock everything down, but what do you replace it with? Williams is sort of archetypal anti anti theorist in ethics. Uh, which is a tradition you're continuing. And yet Williams maintains that there are no external reasons. You want to say perhaps there are. You want to deny that. You do deny that and you deny Williams' thesis. Um, and that that's a bit I found really interesting. For, so I'll just say two things I'm looking at the time. Yeah, on that. Um, so one is on behalf of Williams himself. I mean, he's um, 
he's big and clever enough to defend himself. Even now he's dead. But that's not the point. I, I just wondered if, if actually, if if we take Williams uh, closely at his word, okay, he might he might be able to say that these examples that you talk about, where someone you know comes to, as it were, as it were, see the reasons. For example, when they're in, in a role and adopt certain reasons. The thought is he just might be able to accommodate that. So, for example, he says, as a result of such processes of deliberation, an agent can come to see that he has reason to do something which he did not see he had reason to do at all. In this way, the deliberative process can add new actions for which there are internal reasons, just as it can also add new internal reasons for given actions. I mean, somebody else had an example, a non-moral case, um, where unbeknownst to them at the time, in six months they were going to go to, uh, they'll be going to Israel and there'll be good reason to learn Hebrew. Now the point is, uh, the, the example is supposed to show, actually you do have reason to learn Hebrew now, it's just you don't know it yet, okay? But actually to do, if we look at, if we're kind of detailed about the motivations you've got and what would satisfy those motivations on William's account, you do have that reason. It is, it is connected to something inside of you and it will become apparent, but it's not, it's not external in Williams' sense because it gets a hook on things that matter to you, as it were. It does get, a, it has got a root in your subjective motivational set. Okay, so the first, the first point is, could Williams just more or less agree with what you're saying about uh, about what happens in in roles, for example? Um, it's just that he thinks that if we really understand internal reasons in this broad way of having some kind of connection somewhere, then you know, then fine. Uh, so that's the first kind of thing. I mean, is, is there much to argue about? But that leads to a second point, I think, which is almost, um, I kind of w- wondered, given the sort of project of your book, um, why you took a stand on this at all, okay, on internal reasons and external reasons. reasons. Because it seems to me that what you want to say is that experience, these experiences and visions and, and indeed epiphanies and moments come very much from the outside. But why? Why should reasons? I mean, so it's almost like uh, it's almost like um, the defender of external reasons seems to be committed to a kind of ethical rationalism, moral rationalism, so that there's something, you know, as you say, that we, we want we want to say you have you have a reason to do this. It's a moral reason is just a moral reason can be external. It doesn't have to be connected. But I wondered why you needed to do that. I mean, isn't it? Couldn't it be that epiphanies? Epiphanies aren't reasons, right? Uh, epiphanies are external to someone by definition, but don't they? I mean, can't they just then start the reasoning process, as it were? So I wasn't quite, um, I, I wasn't quite sure what 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 hangs on that, on denying Williams' in, internal reasons thesis. So on the one hand, it seems very. If you really look at Williams, there's always way of. There's always seems to be a way that he can defend any instance you you give of external reason. There seems nearly always to be a way of saying, ah, well, yeah, but actually that can be an internal reason too, because there's something there that perhaps you didn't see it at the time, but it's there inside you. On which reading it just might look like it's what you called um, trivially true. It's t- sort of, it might be true, but it's boring. So what? I thought, yeah, <laughs> everything's somehow connected to a motivation latent or whatever otherwise, right? Um, or, or one might just want to say, um, perhaps, I mean, put it aside i mean you know um why do you need the external regions why do you need to defend the external reasons thesis and deny williams his internal one i guess was my my closing question i'm looking at the time and i'll wrap up and i hope that made some sense